your talk. Thank you so much for having me. I uh, will go ahead and share my slides and get started. Okay, can you hear me and can you see me? Can you yeah. see the slides? Yeah, okay. Thank you. Thank you so much for the introduction. So for today's presentation, um, I will be talking about um, the effects of drone delivery on the bread product delivery time and wastage in Rwanda. So before I get started, I wanted to acknowledge that this study was funded by Canadian Institute for Health Research and all quotas declare no competing interest. So as uh, they just introduced, so I wanted to first talk about why do we care about bread component overall? So as you, all, you might already know, bread component plays an important role in healthcare services. Specifically in maternal care, uh, bread components are used uh, in case of obstetric complications such as hemorrhage, and in pediatric care, they might be used for severe anemia treatment, especially in under five children. And for surgical care, as we already know, especially for maternal care, after C-section or during hemorrhage, bread components are needed. And therefore, that's why we care for the availability in healthcare settings. So specifically in Sub-Saharan Africa, which is uh, our study area, severe anemia accounts for 70% of all transfusions in, in young children. And severe hemorrhage in, is the second cause of tra blood transfusion and the leading cause of maternal mortality. And also road accident is a major issue in this region and is among uh, top cause of uh, mortality in, in general population. And most of the cases uh, after accident, people will need a transfusion in emergency cases. So this is why we really care about the availability of blood component in healthcare and in Sub-Saharan Africa specifically. So if the region is still struggling to achieve sustainable development goals in terms of maternal and child outcomes, so we need to avail these blood components so that these uh, indicators can be achieved moving forward. So although there is a need, there is still a problem of availability because it's still limited. And the issue in terms of availability of blood components, unlike any other pharmaceutical supplies, so blood product uh, supply chain is really complex. So these products are easily perishable and have short lifespan. For instance, blood cells can only be stored for up to 42 days, while uh, other rare products such as Pratrate can be only stored for five days. Another issue is about unpredictability of the demand at the health facility level. For example, for other medic medicines, the facility will know how much on average they will need in a certain month. But this is not the case for blood product because it will, it will depend on the demand, number of accidents or any emergent care, which is most of the time unpredictable. In Sub-Saharan Africa specifically, it might be also the case for other high income countries, there is still poor blood bank infrastructure. Therefore, storing uh, blood cells or any other rare product, it's not really possible. So they will have to request this product from other centers that are able to store blood components or maintaining blood supplies to some hospitals that have infrastructure sometimes leads to uh, product expiration. There is also issue of stockout because this product can, cannot be most of the cases toward other health facilities. Like in case of rare blood products such as Pratrate, hospitals run out of uh, this product and when they are needed in emergency care, it will be an issue for um, treatment of patient. So uh, all these issues, let's now talk about the current system or the traditional system in Rwanda, which is our study area. So Rwanda has five provinces and each province has at least, used to have at least one transfusion center. And the process here was that a health facility will do a request 
at the nearest trans transfusion center. And the test was done in two stages or two different types. So there's what they call back requisition. This is a resupply of blood cell, which can be stored at, health at the health facility for up to 42 days. And then there is also emergency requests, which is what they call nominative requests. These are the requests that are like done on demand for rare blood products. So if there is a patient who is in, in need of resist negative blood cell or protrate, they will do a request to the nearest transfusion center. So what is the issue? You can see that the process is for healthcare providers to fill in the form because uh, traditionally they used to use, uh, to use paper-based system. And then a driver at a certain health facility will drive all the way from hospital to the nearest health uh, transfusion center and submit the request and wait for the orders to be packed and given to them. And then they will again drive back to the health facility. So think about this. This is a paper-based system and there is a round trip involved and there is all administrative work involved. So think about a patient who is in emergency and waiting for treatment or waiting for blood transfusion. So the issue was that most, the, most of the time, the, in case of emergency, there will be a long delivery time and the patient might be, in this case, they might have to be transferred to the higher level uh, of health facility that is able to do the transfusion immediately or opt for a second line treatment. Another issue that uh, mostly was associated with uh, emergency requests was about stockout. So for rare blood product, because they can't be stored at the health facility, they always have to request it when they need it. So there is always stockout of this product. And then for resupply of blood cells that can be stored for 42 days at the facility, there was overstocking because health facilities uh, didn't want to do several trips to go and uh, request this product when they were needed. So they used to request more than what they needed, which is um, which would lead to expiration and wastage in the system. So as you have already seen, they used also a paper-based system. Therefore, there was a poor data records of supply chain and it was hard to, to do monitoring or research related to blood transfusion in Rwanda. So to address these challenges, Rwanda implemented drone delivery of blood components in 2016. So this was a partnership between Rwanda government and a zipline zip company, it's a US-based company, and they launched it in October of 2016 uh, to 20 facilities at start, but currently, they have expanded it to more than 20 health facilities. It's around across the country. The aim was to decrease delivery times and also reduce stockouts and digitalize the supply chain of blood components. So um, the country or Zipline has two distribution centers, uh, one in East and another one in Southern um, part of the country. And they can do on average 100 deliveries per day. And they serve like uh, any health facilities within 80 kilometer radius. As you know, Rwanda is really small. Some of you might already know. So these two distribution centers covers almost 90% of the country outside the capital city. So this is all amazing. And the, the intervention was great, but uh, we also wanted to know what's going on. Is it working? But let's first talk about what the how the intervention works uh, as opposed to standard of care. So as we have seen for standard of care, a healthcare care provider will fill the form. But for the, inter the new intervention, the drone intervention, the order will be online. Like they will use either online platform or web app or use just their phone and send a text message that will be received by a uh, zip line staff. And this is automa automa automatic uh, request, like the same way you would do like DoDash or Uber request or things like that. 
Then the zipline staff will have all the details of different types of, types of blood that are needed. And when they are needed, whether it's a resupply or whether it's emergency. So they will then pack the package and send it to the health facility using the drone. So the drone will go and drop it at the nearest area. Usually it's like within a few minutes. And as the drone uh, approaches the health facility, usually the health provider who made the request will receive a text that the drone will be delivering the package within a few seconds or within minutes. And then they will go and pick, pick her up and go for um, the treatment or use it for, for what is needed for. And then the drone will return to the distribution center. So this is the current um, intervention as opposed to standard of care. So the available evidence shows that the drone delivery of pharmaceutical supplies has uh, effect on delivery times as well, well as well as wastage and stockouts. But these studies are mostly from high income countries. To our knowledge, this was the first implementation of use of drone in medical care in African settings. And we wanted to understand whether this intervention actually works in terms of reducing delivery times and wastage in Rwanda. So this is what we did. We conducted our study in the first 20 health facilities that received the intervention. So it was district and provincial hospitals. So I mentioned previously that the country has two distribution centers, but the first 20 district and provincial hospitals were served by only one distribution center. So this is what we included in our analysis. So, um, how did we do it? So we used two different study designs. First, we used a cross-sectional comparison, looking at uh, pre-intervention measurement of delivery time and post-intervention measurement of uh, delivery times and compare them to see whether there was a decrease or not. So to do that, uh, we used driver estimate and Google map estimate for pre-intervention measurement. And then after the intervention, because the zipline has a database that uh, captures all the details of order when it was done and when it was delivered. So we use the actual emergency delivery times by drone from March, 2017 to December, 2019. So I will talk later about the challenges and why we chose to use driver estimate and Google Maps as opposed to the actual pre-intervention measurement of delivery times. The second study was, uh, the second st study design was interrupted time series. So we wanted to compare longitudinal trends before and after policy change. And we used data from January, 2015 to December, 2019. So this design uh, um, shows you immediate level change after program implementation, but also over time or trend change. And the, the assumption is that if there wasn't an intervention, you would observe similar trend as the pre-intervention trend. So we use data from health management information system to look at longitudinal trend of expiries over time. So this system corrects data on healthcare services utilization and it contains information on, on number of units of blood that expired at each health facility. So we extracted data for our 20 health facilities and looked at the number of expiries over time. We also used Google Map to extract data on driving time from one hospital to the nearest transfusion center. And we also used driving times that were documented before um, intervention implementation. So for driving time, we used two data sources. And then we also used ZipLine database and extracted information regarding delivery types and the, orders that were made by health facilities and delivery information uh, post-intervention. So our outcomes included delivery times 
and, and, and monthly number of expired units. So to compare delivery times before and after intervention, we used the Coxon signed rank test and also conducted segmented regression to look at level change and trend change post intervention. So what did we find? So uh, between March 2017 to December 2019, on our, uh, our bright product orders were approximately 12,733. Like these are the number of orders that were made by 20 health facilities. And 43% of them were emergency orders. So these were orders made in case of rare pro bright product or where it was needed and patient was in emergency care. And then of the emergency orders, the, the delivery was um, the, the drone delivered uh, around 14,651 emergency units. So each order, I wanted to differentiate here, the orders versus units. So each order will, will have like a certain number of units. So it might be, like blood cell units, platelet or resist negative units. So one order might contain multiple units and they can be delivered at different time point, depending on when each unit are needed at the hair facility. And on average, um, each facility uh, made 276 orders per month uh, uh, per facility. And most of units were of type O, and 91% were resist positive. So in terms of our main outcomes, the first one was delivery time. So what did, what did we find? So the first law, the gray one, shows the round trip. So here we, we used estimated driving time to transfusion center and Google map driving time and compare it to the drone average time post intervention. As you can see, it will uh, it, it will take around two hours to drive from one hair facility to the nearest hair facility in the transfusion center, why it will take only for one minute for a drone to make the delivery. And the same for Google Map, actually we take around same time, uh, 139 minutes. So that leads us to the time difference between estimated driving time and drone time of 79 minutes. So the drone will be faster 79 minutes than the traditional way of using a driver uh, to, the, to the transfusion center. And also Google Maps uh, showed same result of 98 minutes faster for the drone. So uh, this is what should be done. Like the round trip, usually the, the driver will go back and forth. But we also looked at the hypothetical scenario. Let's assume that a transfusion center had their own car and driver would not have to leave the hospital and go to transfusion center. Instead, the, once the uh, hospital make, uh, made a request, the driver will leave the tra transfusion center with orders and go back to the hospital. So considering one way trip, still drone was faster uh, 19 minutes compared to estimated driving time and 28 minutes compared to Google Map driving time. In terms of number of expiration using interacted time series, as you can see on this plot, there was immediate change post intervention period. So um, here uh, the, we, we estimated that we after the intervention, there will be seven fewer blood unit expiration per facility per month, and then a decreasing trend post intervention. And I have to mention that the trend was not significant, but still you can see that there was a decreasing trend. And we, we estimated that um, at each facility, uh, this decreasing trend will lead to 67% decrease at 12 months. It is also is yeah, interesting. Yeah. So some of you might have already noticed, although our study is the first study to show the effect on delivery, effect of drone use on delivery time, as well as uh, wastage in the system, but it has also a number of limitations. First, we used honorary estimates uh, for pre-intervention 
delivery time instead of using actual driving records. So initially we had planned to collect data and extract information around uh, driving time from patient record or hospital administrative record, but the study was conducted at the beginning of COVID, therefore we failed to do so, but we used what we had and we used two data sources to validate our estimates. We also used the uh, comparison, like we compared uh, pre-post um, delivery time, and this design has a number of limitations as well, because you are not able to look at overtime trends, like whether the driving time changed because of season or because of any other different things that might happen over time. So with uh, this, comparison of pre-post measurement, we are missing out that information. Lastly, we did not use a control group. So other hospitals that were not receiving intervention were no viable controls, mostly because those hospitals were either uh, near the transfusion centers, therefore the driving time was really less and not comparable to the intervention group, or there were bigger hospitals like referral hospitals that couldn't be compared to the intervention a group that is mostly in rural areas. So this means that our findings might not be um, uh, generalized to non-remote hospitals or areas. So to, just to conclude, the, the, the study showed reduction in delivery time and the wastage of blood components. So this means that like more timely delivery of blood product will lead to lower stockouts of rare product and probably timely treatment of patient. And we now we know that there is a potential for medical surprise using drone in sub-Saharan Africa settings. Uh, so we recommend future research to explore patient outcomes, like whether there is a link between drone delivery and patient outcomes because that's the end goal. We want to make sure that we are using this intervention to improve surgical care, maternal care, or treatment of under children that are in need. And also look at the cost side of it. Is the drone cost effective compared to the standard of care? So that's another question to explore. Also effect of uh, drone on other medical product. I know that Several countries have started to use drones for delivery of other emergency medicine. And this is another area to explore moving forward. Thank you so much. I will take questions. If that was awesome, uh, Mary Paul. Thank you so much for that presentation. It was uh, incredibly insightful and um, you've raised a lot of really uh, interesting uh, things that I think we all need to explore um, as we discuss this. So we're gonna, um, we're gonna uh, move on to Dr. Uh, Delaney's talk and then, um, and then we'll um, come back for sort of a group discussion session on, on both of these. Thank you. Um, let me uh, share my screen again. There we go. Well, um, we are, Equally excited uh, to have Megan Delaney uh, join us. Um, Megan is the chief uh, of the Division of Pathology and Laboratory Medicine uh, and the director of transfusion medicine at Children's National Hospital. She's a professor of pathology and pediatrics um, at George Washington University in Washington, DC. Dr. Delaney uh, serves on the board of directors for the AABB and is a scientific member of the BEST Collaborative and is a member of the board of the Pathology Test Development Advisory Committee. Dr. Delaney's scholarly focus is in clinical pathology, laboratory medicine, transfusion medicine, pediatric transfusion medicine, and immunohematology. She's, over, she's written over 100 peer-reviewed publications and lectures uh, nationally and internationally. In global health, Dr. Delaney focuses on improving access to safe blood transfusion in developing nations. She serves as the chair of the NIH's Blood Safe program that aims to improve access to safe blood in Sub-Saharan Africa. Finally, Megan received her bachelor's degree in biology from the University of Vermont, master's in public health from the University of Washington, 
uh, and the University of New England. Uh, she celebrated or completed rather <laughs> her clinical pathology residency at uh, Beth Israel Deaconess Medical Center um, in Boston, Massachusetts, and her transfusion medicine at Bloodworks Northwest in Seattle, Washington. Megan, thank you so much for joining us. Um, really looking forward to your talk. Thank you so much. And to uh, all the Boston people, I, I'm from Cape Cod, so I'm a, a kind of a, a local, um, although I've lived in different places. Nicole, thank you for the introduction. I'm going to share my screen. Okay, three, share, and then present. Are we in presentation mode? We are. Okay, great. I changed the title a little bit from what I told you. Um, I'm going to talk about the study that you asked for me to talk about, and I'm going to talk about one other study. I was really um, intrigued by, you know, that this seminar is specifically also, you want to know, like, kind of the story behind the study. I, I you know, that's the guidance I was given, and so I've, I've done that. And then, you know, because people on this uh, call are are interested in global health. I, I'm also going to tell you about the very first study I ever did in global health in contrast to the one I'll spend the most time on, just to sort of um, tell you about my own learning as, as you try to uh, make global health part of your career. Um, so I'm going to start with James Blundell. Um, James Blundell was an obstetrician. Um, and, and, and Dr. Blundell was in, in the UK, and, and he is, is claimed to be the first person to have really done a human to human blood transfusion. And it was for a woman who had obstetrical hemorrhage. And that was in 1818. So we've come a long way. But what's really striking as we heard the previous speaker and what I'll talk about today is that the world is not equal in its access to blood. And that a lot of the work I've been doing is, is, is looking, trying to look and characterize that and, and hopefully find ways to improve it like the excellent uh, presentation we just heard. So, so as was also introduced previously is, you know, the, the need for blood in low resource settings. We generally, you know, we talk about these, these three large buckets and, and they're important. Um, some of them are different than high index countries and some of them are the same. So injury is, is the same or could be the same. Uh, malaria is not equally distributed around the world. Um, and postpartum hemorrhage could be equally distributed around the world. However, the ability to treat it is not the same around the world. So, oops, I went the wrong way. Um, you know, it, through my travels um, in, in Africa, in African nations and the friends that I've made, you know, these are just a couple of pictures that I, I took that I, I used to remind us about, you know, when, when you're there and what it feels like and, and, and the visualization of, of the difficulties of the supply chain. So, you know, this is a blood donation um, recruitment poster from Ghana, um, which is, to me is a pretty severe message. The blood bank is bankrupt, right? That's, um, that's a pretty um, harsh message and, and really trying to really make people realize how important this is. And in Uganda, they had done an amazing job collecting all this blood. Um, this was from one of the blood center uh, refrigerators. Um, however, it was sitting waiting to be tested um, or waiting to be tested for blood type or for infectious diseases. And so it wasn't getting out to the patients where it needs to be. So these snapshots just, to bring you to, to, to what it's like um, trying to execute the transfusion services um, in, in countries that don't have enough resources. So I'm going to talk about, I'm mostly going to talk about my, 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 the study we published in Lancet Hematology about estimating the global need for blood and giving you a sort of behind the curtain of how that study came to be. And then I'm going to, with the last little few minutes, I'm just going to tell you about my initiation into global uh, health and transfusion medicine, because I, I think it, to me, it's a compelling, I, I learned a lot of lessons and I, I want to share them with you. So um, the study that I was you know, asked to talk about is, is this one, which was published in the Lancet Hematology in 2019. Um, and in this study, um, we were attempting to describe the entire world's need of blood um, through modeling. And so let me tell you about how this study came to be. I think you know all studies have an interesting story. Um, and so these are the four authors. And, and how it started is that um, Christina Fitzmaurice, Dr. Fitzmaurice, she's a hematologist, and she was on, on a K-12 um, benign hematology award. And she asked me, she came to me, and, and we've been talking, I've been teaching her as a fellow for transfusion medicine, I was her attending, and she said, what do you think about, you know, she said, I work at IHME, and I'll tell you about that in a minute. 
she's like, a, you know, she's a, she's a big data person and also a hematologist. What do you think about if we tried to model the need for blood? Because I hear that it's not really modeled as precisely as it could be. And I was like, wow, that's a brilliant, interesting idea. I'm like, but how are we going to do that? And so um, Nicholas Roberts and Spencer James are both, were at the time, were Sorry. Sometimes my camera will drop. I will keep trying to pop it back on. Sorry about that. Um, and so they were the um, biostatisticians that were able to do this modeling uh, uh, using data sets. And then I was the transfusion um, person and, and the mentor around uh, the field, the, the actual field of transfusion medicine. Um, and, you know, I, I also want to tell everyone, I think, you probably know about IHME, but but through um, living in Seattle and, and watching this um, institute come to life, I, I, I wanted to understand it better, um, being interested in public health and global health. And so um, I highly recommend this book, um, Epic Measures. It's written about the founder of IHME, and his name is Christopher Murray. Um, and it's, it's his biography about how he wanted to um, measure health better essentially. Um, and and his, his really seminal work is called the Global Burden of Disease Study, which publishes um, every so often how everyone on the planet has died. And he's gone much further than that, but this is now an international operation of data metrics. And of course, they've become very prominent through our COVID pandemic. They've been one of the, the groups often interviewed on the news talking about modeling the global uh, pandemic of COVID. So, so that's um, where the data scientists came from and the tools that we, we had access to. So, so the goal of our study was very simple, um, was to know how much blood is needed at a national level that's essential for targeting this health you know, make it better or, 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 or predict what we should be doing. And we also were aware that, you know, the WHO has set a target of 10 to 20 donations per 1,000 population. And, and this is a, you know, a, a great number and it's a good generalization, but we wanted to become more specific. We wanted to look at each population and say, well, because of the diseases that they have and the number of people that they have, could we refine this number with our modeling study? So, um, I'm going to show you a few pictures to sort of describe the, the, the way the model was constructed. So if you start with um, kind of a, this one, you start with the population profile of, of a country. And there's an unidentified transfusion need due to lack of access of care. And I will start from the beginning and say, that's not really able to be captured in the model that we used. Then the next box is the identified transfusion needs resulting in demand. And those, that demand can either be appropriate demand, medically necessary, or inappropriate demand. Those are the two boxes that this study really gets at. We aren't really able to determine if blood was ordered and not needed at this level in the model. Okay, but it's important to think about those segmentations of, of, of the model and uh, Okay. The, um, this picture shows the progression of how we the model was constructed. So first was to estimate the total spe disease specific transfusions given over time in the USA. And I'm going to tell you about that because actually to produce this study, we had to do a modeling study of the United States. So we published that as well and I'll tell you about that in a minute. And then divide the total disease specific transfusions by the US disease specific prevalence rate. And then number three was key to then determine the lowest disease specific transfusion rate over time with the assumption that this is the ideal disease specific transfusion rate. And then to multiply that ideal disease specific transfusion rate with the disease specific prevalence by the country to determine the national level of transfusion needs. And then this could be brought further to estimate the country's specific total transfusion supply and then with another database that we were able to access to take, well, this is the supply that we predict is needed and to contrast that with what that country says that they have collected and the delta would be the gap. So sh shown another way is that if it is known how much blood is needed on an on average for a specific diagnosis. Okay, I'm just going to give a to you. Let me see me pick a picture. Just 
sorry about that. And it is known how much blood is needed on average for a specific diagnosis and the prevalence of that diagnosis in a population, then the total transfusion need can be estimated. So let me tell you about these reference databases, and I've, I've kind of introduced them a little bit, but I'll go a little bit more detail. So um, using the HCUP database um, from 2000 to 2014, which is an all-payer inpatient healthcare database of 30 procedure codes, and then also adding in care records, including procedure and revenue codes. So that was how we were working on that one through three, which is the I, trying to find an idealized transfusion rate. And then the global part of the study was coordinated with the IHME um, databases because they have in their databases the prevalences of all the diseases by country. And so then we could estimate incidence, prevalence, mortality, and other metrics. And this included 195 countries from 100. It was done. Um, contemporaneously with the global study because we needed it to be able to have the, um, the information to um, make our idealized transfusion rate. So this was published in Transfusion Increases Science in 2021. And you know this is really just a sidebar, but it, what we, we did find, which was I think interesting, is that from, from 2011 to 2014, I flipped the numbers to 2011 to 2014, that actually transfusions in the United States decreased. Um, and it, we presume it's probably because of better blood utilization in the United States. Um, and when I start to show maps of the whole world, you can start to look at where the United States falls on it, on, on it in the model of its blood utilization. And this is just one more slide about the, the US study. These graphs show um, the basically very, the black is all blood component use. The red over time, 2000 to 2014. The red is red cells. The yellow is plasma. The green is platelets, and the and the pink is whole blood. And, and it so what we found in this model of the U.S. is that actually see that frozen. Can you still hear me? Can you hear me? We can hear you. Yep. Okay, we great. See. Sometimes I see I'm freezing. I'm trying to pay attention. Um. And the top indications per admission are here. These are the coded diagnoses, right? We didn't do chart reviews. This is from database. But it's interesting to know. So, so we use these data to create the idealized transfusion rate using the, the lower number, right? Because we did have a perception that the U.S. might transfuse too much. So what did we find? So now I'm going to go back to the global study, and I'm going to take you through some, some colorful charts to describe the model and its results. So what this shows is the estimated blood need by region and diagnosis, okay? So if you, these are the regions of the world uh, by categories that are used by IHME. And the colors, I'll point out some of this. So the big blue is like injuries and digestive diseases. Purple is cardiovascular and other non-communicable. The green are musculoskeletal and maternal and neonatal. Um, oranges are diabetes, kidney, chronic respiratory. The black ones and so you can see that the when they're stacked up against each other by the the types of diagnoses that that we have found people are that diagnosis aligns with them receiving a transfusion that these are the different disease categories that would we would think would lead to the regional blood demand per one hundred thousand population. So you can see the Central Europe is actually pretty high, and the African countries are actually lower, right? So when we estimate, so when we show it on a map, I think it helps. It makes it. A, I love the maps. It helps it make more sense. Um, and so this is the estimated blood needs slide. And so this is adjusted for population and diagnosis. So this is the number of blood components needed per one hundred. We, and we sort of just lumped blood components. We had to do some lumping to be able to construct the model that were needed per 100,000 population per country. And so the red is showing um, that the, the need is, is greater, where the green is the need is less. So if you remember this snapshot, you'll see the need is, is greater in, you know, the, in, in Russia, in Eastern Europe. The U.S. has a pretty large blood need. Um, South America, Africa, uh, Southeast Asia, the blood need appears lower. 
So that's an interest. And then you can see that the Eastern Europe, uh, the Western European countries are also orange, as is Australia and China. What about the supply? So again, now the colors are, um, again, red. I, I think we, we kind of did red as, as bad or, you know, not, not bad, but more concerning, right? You either need a lot of blood or you don't have a lot of blood. So in this, in this graph, it's now saying that if it's the countries are red, is the supply per 100,000 population. So this was this data was taken from the WHO Global Status Report on Blood Safety and Availability in 2011, 12, and 13. As I said, the supply is aggregated over all components. So you can start to see now that the countries that are green and light green have um, high supplies. It's sometimes 10,000, the dark green is over 10,000 to 15,000 units of blood per 100,000 population, whereas the red countries have only zero to 500 units of blood per 100,000 population. Those are big differences, right? So you start to see that the, even though we, some of the countries on the previous one were showing that they didn't need much blood, So how does that come out when we do our, um, our gap analysis? So this is the gap analysis, and this is bringing together the supply and the demand, okay, on the disease-specific level. So if you have a country that has a lot of diseases that need a lot of blood, or your country that doesn't, that is, in, that is incorporated into this model. So now you can see that the dark green is a matched supply or oversupply based on their prevalent diseases. The light green is twice the need of supply. And the dark red is the extreme, up to 75 times as high the need over the supply. And so one of the countries that was notable was South Sudan. So if we just pause and really think about this for a minute, you can see that the US, Canada, many South American countries, most green and light green, suggesting that they have enough blood or actually collect too much. Um, and, and so they, they shouldn't have shortages that impact patient care. Um, on the contrary, if you look at Sub-Saharan Africa, there's a lot of orange and red countries and some yellow countries suggesting that there's a real problem there, that, 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 that when we really look at the data, driven by data, not driven by you know, um, anything but those databases I've described that these countries really fall out as having a real gap. So, you know, the conclusions of this study is the transfusion needs differ hugely based on local demographic and disease specific profiles in the region, um, that many countries really face a critical undersupply of transfusions. And actually we think too, as the, remember the, the, the branching diagram I showed you that, you know, there's also people There was really a large unmet need for more government support financially, structurally, and through innovation, such as the previous speaker, and through what? establishment um, of a regulatory oversight to ensure supply, quality, appropriateness, and safety. You know, this study was um, picked up by the press, and so I, I wanted to share that with you. It was, it was an exciting study to, to put out and, and for people to be interested in, and it was picked up across the, the world. Um, so the Science Alert picked up the study, um, uh, Health Issues India picked up the study as well, um, and even NPR on, on their Ghosts and Soda also talked about this study. So that was really uh, rewarding. To, to have the study um, be felt to be so important, um, not only by the scientific community, but also by the, by, you know, the, the lay press um, and the public. Um, so I'm gonna talk for just a couple more minutes about this other little study I wanted to bring to this audience. I thought you'd wanna hear about it. And I call it a glimpse into a complex problem. And I'll set the stage for this. When I was at University of Washington, I, um, before I moved to Washington, DC, I, um, I, and I was doing my MPH in global health, I had to do some projects. And so one project that I did was a situational analysis of the blood transfusion services in Ghana. 
And so this was my first um, time to go to Africa and to learn on the ground about what the blood transfusion was like. Um, and what I found was really fascinating, and we ended up writing a very small paper, not at all covered in the press, but it was, a, it was a, I thought, very interesting because when you think about global health, you think about the forces of change, um, they're not always exactly at least what I thought about in the beginning, so, so I'll explain that to you. So, so as we've described it already, it's, you know, and South um, and north of the of the equator, um, children are are disproportionately affected um, with um, malaria, and and it can cause uh, you know illness, hospitalization, transfusion, and even death. So uh, when I went to uh, Ghana, I um, on my MPH project, I was with um, a colleague of my boss who his name is Daniel Samua, and he worked at a hospital in Ghana, and he invited me to come. And the hospital was run by a gold mining company. And I was, I don't know what I thought about that. I was a little kind of put off by that. I was like, really, they're, they're doing gold mining? And I don't know, you know? But when I got there, I, my eyes were very much open to um, how global health can be impacted by, as I said, by forces outside of, you know, academic medicine and the, the traditional funding sources. So, so they had set up a malaria control program. Right, and what and that I learned a lot about. So this is a big this this Anglo Gold Ashanti is actually a South African based uh, mining company, and they had mining all over the world. And they consider and, and when they, they had um, a, a big malaria problem at their Ghanaian gold mine, and I was basically there on an attachment. Eight hundred malaria patients per month, in which was family, and, family and um, and miners themselves. But their workforce was eight thousand um, workers. So twenty five hundred of they saw twenty five hundred of their workers had malaria that were seen at the hospital per month. Um, and then they would be off for three days per patient equates to seventy five hundred man shifts lost per month. And this coupled with the slow rate of work during the recuperation resulted in a major loss in production and a very high cost of treating the malaria. And then in the community, you know, all the families that lived in the community also were suffering with malaria. And it was actually one of the leading causes of death. So what they did is they decided to implement this integrated malaria control program, which was incredibly impressive and, and was my first um, up close view of how this is done. So they were doing what's called vector control with indoor residual spraying, they were doing bed nets. They were treating the water with larvicide. Um, they were doing education um, and advocating for repellents. And also they had, this is the, the, some of their activities. Uh, the gentleman here in blue, they're spraying the insecticide in the buildings. Every a few times a year, they would go to the houses and put all the furniture in the middle of the house and spray the walls and let it dry. And then the families could put the, the furniture back in place. Um, they tracked it like a military operation. operation. And in this laboratory that, where you can see the cups and stuff, there's actually, they're growing mosquito larva to determine if the, if the vector would become resistant to the current pesticide because they were rotating that insecticide. So, you know, that's kind of a, a tangent a little bit, but you know, bringing it back to medicine, you know, this is my one slide from this study, my, my results. When, we, when I got there, you know, as someone interested in pediatrics, interested in transfusion, we did a very simple study going through the books of the hospital and looking at the time before the, the malaria control program was put in place, which was in 2003, and then the time that the malaria control program was in place. And we looked at and then the white bar next to it is how many uh, were tested after. And then the, between the two red lines is uh, malaria positive children. So all of them, MP positive, all children, then it divided out by zero to five years, which is higher than five to nine years. And then the lower one is the number of children who actually need a transfusion due to malaria. And so what we found when they controlled malaria was a 40% decline in malaria cases, a 12.8 decline in pediatric patients needing transfusion. And in general, just their measured hemoglobin was higher in 2009 compared to 2003. So 
you know, it was a th this whole story, you know, coming back to this was Dr. Uh, Dr. Price, my mentor, who had mentored uh, Mr. Samua from Ghana um, in Seattle, and then and then hosted me uh, kind of as an exchange um, in Ghana, and I was able to learn that, and and it really was eye opening because it does really show that a private commercial need to also be involved in public health, um, and and it, it it makes you realize how how big the the um, I don't know the world is and how, how many others think about it besides you know us doctors if you will um so this is my last slide um i think you know the most important thing is you know the world does not have enough blood where it is needed um i think our modeling study shows you know that prevalent diagnoses do increase demand and what i just showed you kind of to reinforce that is that malaria um de increases demand for blood transfusion right for sure and so if you have malaria and you're using your blood for malaria where well, you have less blood for surgery then, right? If you think about it that way, or there's a, there's a people, everyone's trying to use a small supply. That's, you know, this complex supply chain um, in really, in, it increases the difficulty of supplying facilities and especially located in distant and rural, rural places. Um, it, it, I don't really talk about this in this uh, talk, but I have other studies that when we looked at the hospital capabilities, and, and there's a, there's a, quite a bit of evidence um, that hospitals are you know have to collect their own blood um, when the blood suppliers are not able to get blood to them, and, and that's a difficult thing for them to do. Um, and so you know overall, uh, you know I think having giving me this you know this platform talking about this topic here is, is wonderful and welcome and and that that not only you know government and public health but you know commerce and industry i think needs to to be involved in these in in these discussions um also because they they have finances to contribute to the problem as i showed you with with the gold mine story so i want to uh, thank you very much for inviting me and i, I look forward to our discussion so thanks Thank you, Megan. That was awesome. Um, I think both of those uh, talks were um, uh, detailed and thorough and comprehensive and uh, provided uh, a really, uh, I think, different perspectives of the same problem uh, and potential uh, solutions to them. Uh, thank you both for being here. I'm going to share um, our uh, the results of our poll um, ever so briefly. And let's see. Okay, so just before we start our discussion, just wanted to give everybody a sense of where uh, where we all are situated, um, and uh, pretty good spread uh, across the world today. So um, let's go ahead and uh, start with questions for either uh, Dr. Uh, Nissen Gizway or Dr. Delaney. Just raise your hand and uh, we'll call on you. Srinik, Srinik Kundu. Hello, everybody. I'm uh, Srinik Kundu. I'm a research fellow at PGSSC. Um, thank you. Thank you both presenters for amazing presentation. And thank you, Dr. Delaney, for actually explaining and giving us a brief snapshot of the behind the scenes and the inception of this huge study. Uh, <clears throat> I would also like to point out that it took me at least five separate reads to understand the modeling approach. But you explained it perfectly with one slide and and the flow chart. Um, it also shows the importance of these seminars. Uh, I know you talked about the need and demand and uh, distinguished it from each other. I understand it, but my understanding is still very limited. Like, can you explain it further in your words? Yeah, so I can try. And if I don't answer, ask again. Um, but, but thanks for those kind words. Uh, method sometimes of papers. Um, so, and also the data scientists that built the model, you know, that I showed their picture, 
I learned so much from them myself. I'm not a data a data modeling scientist, and, and it's such a fascinating field, and you can see the power of it. If you look up IHME, they have the most interesting studies. I mean, Nick Roberts, who was our lead author for our paper, has just published another one about snake bites across the world, right? So with that data that, that they've created, they, um, they can answer and help us with so many things. So when I talk about supply and demand, um, you know, it's a model. All models have weaknesses, right? So I can tell you some of the weaknesses of the study, right? So number one, our idealized transfusion rate is based in the United States. Is that right? Well, we don't have malaria in the United States. So some of those things we had to make judgments about, right? But we also had to pragmatically figure out a way to get an idealized transfusion uh, rate. We actually wanted to use New Zealand. We felt that New Zealand um, has, has some, evidence, some data that suggests that they don't over transfuse the way that we think we do in the United States. Um, so, so that's one thing. Um, so the other part was the supply. So I mentioned that the countries report to WHO on regular bases about how much blood they have. And that was what we used as our supply. That's what they report. I think for people in the blood industry that work in the country, I keep freezing, um, because as I suggested, you know, in some countries, the nationalized transfusion service is collecting and distributing a, quite a bit of blood. But if you're 500 miles away in a hospital, you might not be able to be supplied by that supply. And so you might be collecting your own blood. And so it's possible that the supply numbers that we got from the WHO reporting of each country potentially underestimate their supply. Um, does that make sense? And, and then the other piece that is, um, when I go, went through the colorful flow diagram, you know, that also, when you think about transfusion, you know, we, could, we generalize it and think, well, if a doctor orders blood, it should have been given. But I remember what I just said about what we know about the U.S. and what we've been learning over the past 20 years is that blood sometimes, especially if it's plentiful, is given and maybe it wasn't technically needed. Um, and so, but the model can't look at that. There's, there wasn't really any way. You have to make a judgment at the individual patient level if that blood was needed. Thank you. Was, Thank you yeah. for that. Thank you for that. I, I, on a, another lighter note, I just want to know, like, this is such a huge study with 195 countries and the modeling approach is just so long and, and it's so complicated. How long did it take you to do the whole study from oh, a from long time? The <laughs> yeah. yeah, a long time. Um, and as I said to states first to be able to even do it, right? Um, and so, and actually the 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 reason that the the publication dates are different is we had a hard time getting the US data published. Um, to be honest, the journals were not interested in it, which I thought was, I don't know, I thought they should have been. Um, so that was hard. We got rejected from a couple of journals for the US study. Um, it, so I think we, we probably started in 2016 talking about this study and we published it in 2019. I, if I can remember correctly, it was something like that. It might've been, yeah, I bet you we started in 2016. So that's a long time. Um, and it was a, and there was a lot, when we published with Lancet Hematology, I think we actually first submitted to Lancet Global Health and they told us they wanted to move it to Lancet Hematology. We're like, okay, I, in some ways I wanted it in global health uh, more because of the readership being more broad and, and bringing, bringing transfusion to the global health field. And as, as Nicole and I have talked about that, it tends to not be as prominent, but that's what Lancet decided. So, so that's what we went with. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Delaney. Like, I'm a awesome. big fan of the work, but thank you so much. <laughs> thank you. Good stuff. Um, so uh, we have a question from uh, Ananya, and then we're going to move to 641 after that. Ananya Admasu. Uh, yeah, thank you. Uh, wonderful presentation from both presenters. My question is for Dr. Delaney. Um, 
from your presentation, especially the first map uh, on uh, demand uh, based on per 100,000 uh, population, um, I've seen uh, some African countries in green, uh, but that's where you have high volume of trauma, which is one of the uh, highest areas where blood transfusion is needed. And you have infectious diseases such as malaria, um, uh, schistosomiasis, and all those other infectious diseases that predisposes to severe anemia, which also requires uh, transfusion. So um, just based on that, and then on the next, on the second map, uh, based on supply, there is low supply, right? So I'm just thinking, do you think maybe the first map where the demand showed low is because of poor national recording rather than a, a true reflection of um, the situation on the ground? Yeah, no, great Thank question. You. And I think we talk about some of these things in our discussion um, in the paper. So I, I think you're right. I think that a model has relativeness to each other. So one thing I wanna say is that if you're in the United States and you have access to transfusion without an issue, there's a lot of blood used for CV surgery in our country. And there is really probably little to no bypass CV surgery in, in some of those countries, right? So, so in comparison, um, the, the demand is so much greater um, based on the history of having CV surgery and cancer care I think that we, the model, because those things aren't, those types of therapies are not as available, shows that as well. We, the, the demand is so much higher in countries that are dealing with non-communicable lifestyle related diseases or I don't know if cancer is lifestyle related, but you know, um, and and when you, then you look at um, an African country where their their uh, sort of trajectory of healthcare is at a place where there's they they still have sort of neglected tropical diseases still holding them back from investing in resources for CV surgery and higher level of cancer care and higher level of elective surgery. So, so that's one thing that I think the model shows um, and that we think that the demand in those countries will be higher when their health d development index increases. Um, I, I also think the populations are, are, are very different, right? I mean, the U.S. is an enormous, an enormous country. And so is, you know, some of those other countries that we showed population isn't as high. But I also think you are right about the data collection. You know, it does go back to IHME's data collection, and I only have like a little window into that, but they actually have people in most countries on the ground to try to get to d those disease data, the, 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 the quantification of diseases in their countries. And so we were relying on IHME's um, machinery, you know, human you know, capital and machinery for every country reporting, but it's something that they are always doing. So each, I think it's like every five or 10 years, they put out a new global burden of disease study, um, IHME, and it says this is all the diseases in the, in the world. And, and each time they're refining their own model for how they pull those data. Thank you. Um, great question and uh, an in, in insightful answer. Um, 641 has been waiting for a while to ask a question. Can't hear you yet. Still fixing the audio. Um, maybe while you guys work on that, we can uh, we can go to uh, Sarah Ness. I'm on it. Hi, all. Um, there, there's, oh, it looks like 641. Oh, okay. Awesome. All right. Uh, let's get the. Let's get uh, 641 while uh, while the audio works. Go for it. Okay. Um, thank you for the presentation. It has been a uh, very interesting topic uh, from different perspectives. Uh, my question would be for Dr. Nathan Swift, and I wanted to know a little bit more about what challenges you encountered and what strategies 
you would recommend for establishing uh, that kind of relationship with the local government when they doing this sort of interventions, especially with drones? And how do you think uh, it could be also used in other countries that may be a little bit apprehensive to use that type of technology? Uh, have you thought of expanding this work? Because I think it is very useful uh, based on the on the findings from your paper. But I wonder if you think this would be a challenge in other countries or in, in, in Rwanda. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you for a great question. Just to clarify, um, we conducted this evaluation as like an independent uh, research team. So we were not really part of the implementing um, uh, component, but I can talk a little bit about the challenges because I understand the work and I've been working with both the government and the zip line to conduct this study. So um, in terms of challenges, definitely as you have seen, like I have presented on my slide, the, in terms of coverage, Rwanda is small, right? And the zip line, uh, system can only recover like within eight kilometer, right? So I know that Zipran is now implementing similar intervention in India and Ghana, like these are bigger countries. So, but one of the challenges or one of the things that uh, countries have to think about when they start thinking about this intervention is in terms of coverage, right? So there are countries with similar settings as Rwanda, but because of how distant hospitals might be from the distribution centers. So the intervention might only be, might cover like a specific area, not the entire country, right? So Rwanda is quite small and they are privileged for this intervention to be co uh, covering around 90% uh, of, uh, of the region and are, are like reaching all health facilities. Another thing to think about is also about the need, right, of the country. So most of the time I've seen that when these interventions are being implemented, sometimes they miss out what the country really needs. And what Zipran did or Rwanda did in partnership was to identify the need, right? So Dr. Dlin talked about um, gap in terms of availability of uh, blood, but in Rwanda, the issue wasn't necessarily not having blood component, right? But it was about the complexity of supply chain. How do we make sure that even if we have blood product and they are stored at dif different uh, transfusion centers, how do we make sure that they are available on time in rural areas or in rural facilities? So overall think about what the country needs when you are in terms of in, in this partnership and understand, uh, talk with the people on the ground to understand what they need and what might be useful for that intervention as well. So it, it's basically understanding what the country needs and respond to those needs instead of just bringing up technology uh, without considering the local context. And in terms of, I'll talk also a little bit about, uh, in terms of probably conducting research in partnership with government and Zipline. Um, I would say that uh, when we started this study, the government of Rwanda wanted an independent team uh, to look at the effect of this intervention because it was really something big for first country to implement the, the innovation. So they wanted for this research to be independent from the implement and the, the founder, which is the government. So um, we, we made sure to work with both teams because as you have seen, we used both data from Ministry of Health, Health Management Information System, but we also used the prime database. So we did not really consider their input on how to design the study, but we needed them. So you need that partnership with both parties, first to understand what's going on on the ground and also to have access to data because that's what you need to be, be able to evaluate the, the, the intervention, but also put it into context while discussing and interpreting your results. So that's what I would say about that. Great, great answer. Um, and you know, I think that 
that contact specific approach uh, for all of these uh, for, you know, whether it's drone based delivery or other strategies to solve this challenge that, uh, you know, that Dr. Delaney's paper really outlined are um, going to be very important. It's not going to, the same solution won't work everywhere. Um, we have, um, I'm going to go back to Sarah Nuss, uh, and then we have, uh, I think, two more questions and about 11 minutes. So we'll try to keep it on time. You had a great segue into my question, Dr. Eicher. Um, but first of all, thank you both for using presentations. Really interesting papers to read, but it's more interesting to hear in person. So we really appreciate you being here today. Um, my name is Sarah. I'm a research collaborator with the PGSSC. I'm based in Rwanda for the year. Um, this question is directed at both of you, but I guess I'll start with you, Marie Paul. I'm very curious to know um, your perspective or if you could speak a little bit more about how um, the role of your study, which is a, a local study that evaluates these gaps within a context specific setting um, that takes into account differences and burdens of disease and provider practices based off you know, where the study is conducted, um, what role studies like that can play um, in larger studies or informing larger studies such as Dr. Delaney Year's study that's looking at this at a, on a more kind of international level, um, how they might be complementary and whether there is a pathway for like context specific local studies um, and the data from those studies to play more of a significant role going forward in international studies. Sure, that, that's a great question. So I would say uh, based on the um, Dr. Delaney study, we saw that there is a gap in Africa, right? In terms of supply. And based on the available evidence, many intervention addressing uh, broad gaps have been honorary in, mostly implemented in, uh, in high income countries, especially using technology. Because as you know, in Africa, technology is still limited. Even if we have a higher burden of the disease, many of the interventions um, using technology are still limited. So by looking at this gap, like what my study tells you is that where there is a need for a uh, blood, if for example, if you have seen on the picture that she showed, um, like the storage of bread product in Uganda, right? So that shows you that many of these products are stored in boxes and probably they are not yet, yet tested, but they will also need uh, advanced infrastructure to store them and deliver them on a time, right? So this is how the, these studies complement each, each other. So they showed us a gap in Africa. We have high burden of disease. They show the gap of storage and delivering them. But we have also this intervention that was tested in similar settings, like let's say the example of Uganda, Rwanda and Uganda are in similar settings. So this is a technology that can be adopted because it shows that there is improvement in terms of expiration or wastage and also delivery time. So instead of storing this bread product, waiting for being tested and being delivered in remote areas, why can't we use the technology that shows that actually it's, it improves expiration, reduces the expiration and also delivery time, especially in remote areas. So this is something that we like can really be used, but we have also to take about, to take into consideration the uh, local and technology accessibility in different uh, health facilities in remote areas because some of the technology that is available in Rwanda might not be the same in Uganda or any other country. So 